Hi, everyone. Hello. I feel like it's morning, but no, it's afternoon. It's morning when you wake up. <laughs> it is morning when you wake up. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming out. I'm super excited to have you and to be here for this panel with Reagan. Um, so yeah, let's give a round of applause for everyone and Reagan. <laughs> We're going to be talking about um, Reagan's new book, The Secret History of Black Punk, which is out from Silver Sprocket right now. Um, and I'm going to read you a short bio about Reagan that is on her website, so it's not a surprise. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, so Reagan Buchanan, who is to my left, um, is an artist from Erie, PA, who resides in Columbus, Ohio, and paints murals, draws portraits, makes comics, plays drums, and chooses death by typeface. So it's essentially, she does everything um, that one could do. Um, she is the author of The Secret History of Black Punk, The Zine Strange Glances. She also runs Pocktober Art, which is a really amazing drawing challenge that happens every October. She runs that with her collabor collaborator, Southside Frank. Um, and I'm so excited to be talking with her today. My name is Rachel Miller. Um, I make a zine called See You in the Dollar Bin, Dollar Bin that's all about comics, and I'm not exhibiting, even though my badge says it is, says I am. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started, okay. and I'll stop talking so you can talk. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you got to tell me what to say. Oh, OK. I have to tell you what to say. <laughs> um, I guess we can start off. So yeah, everyone welcome Reagan again. <laughs> Yay, SPX. Um, OK, I'm going to start off with a really big, broad question. So your book is called The Secret History of Black Punk. Yes. Um, when did you get into punk music, and how? OK. Um, actually, I, I, I want to say I got into it really young, but I don't know if that's actually like really that young, or when people get into music. Um, but I think I was around. Uh, 12 years old, and I had um, older brothers. I've got a brother who is 11 years older than me, and a brother who's four years older than me. And I just was, oh, I just wanted to do everything that they did. So they would be in their room, and they would be like listening to, you know, the Beastie Boys and Kiss and Metallica and stuff like that. And I would be like in the doorway, like looking in, and they'd be like, what do you get out of here, <laughs> <laughs> you kid, or whatever. Um, but my oldest brother left home when he was 16 and um, kind of, you know, did like couch surfing and stuff like that. And he went to Pittsburgh and started a band called Submachine. And he used to send us like mixtapes, help me, would send them to my brother, Courtney. And um, I just wanted to do whatever they did. So um, that's kind of like through the mixtapes from my brother. That's kind of like how I got into punk music. So That's awesome. I feel like my brothers were not into as good of bands. They were into like Incubus <laughs> <laughs> and the Red Hot Chili Pepper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, then, I mean, your brothers are probably younger. Yeah, they are. They're, yeah. yeah, but not as fun. Not as fun. <laughs> <laughs> was there like um I imagine there wasn't like a huge punk scene in Erie? I was actually um I was actually like kind of a overprotected child. Okay. So I wasn't really allowed to go anywhere or like explore. Like when I went to high school, I you know, told my parents that I played basketball so I could, like, have a boyfriend or whatever. Nice. Like, so I could, like, go somewhere after school. I wish I had know? thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> they never checked because they didn't want to go see me play basketball. I was not good at lying. <laughs> <laughs> but Erie, um, Erie had a, Erie had a big, uh, a, it had a punk scene and it had a hardcore scene okay. um, and it had a heyday, which was, like, before I was able to participate in it like my um you know my brother participated in it 
and they had like a, I don't know when it stopped, but they definitely had a, a punk rock picnic that still went on into like 2015 or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, I would say that it had like uh, a scene that I wasn't necessarily like super a part of. I didn't play instruments back then, which is like, um, or like, you know, being a photographer or doing zines or about punk rock or whatever, which is like kind of the normal way that people participate in the scene. So I did, um, there were, you know, it, Erie had a lot of, I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. Erie had like a lot of like emo hardcore bands. Okay. And a lot of people were into Krishna core. Oh. And um, oh, I probably never told you that before. <laughs> no. I probably, we should, um, Maybe I should go. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I was, by the time I was kind of in those scenes, I was actually more in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. So, yeah. And you came to Columbus for um, art school? Yeah, or were you there college. beforehand? No, just okay. for college. Yeah. And then that's kind of when you started being more in the scene? Um, let me see. When did I start being more in the scene? Yeah, I think the, uh, the I think I, well, like with, with music, with like the music side, like I got yeah. um, started kind of later in life. Like, um, my parents were very much like, you are going to have to work like twice or three times as hard as everybody else to get where everybody else gets, like based on the fact that you're a woman, based on the fact that you're black. You're not, you can't just be going off playing guitar mm -hmm. or whatever. So I remember we had an acoustic guitar that I would, um, play but you know I was like little so I thought it was boring I wanted to play electric guitar and I wasn't allowed to get one and it was kind of like I was pushed to be um you know in school and paying attention like nose in the books and stuff like that gotcha. so I kind of did not like persevere into you know finding a way to play I kind of just was like okay and I gave it up and so I didn't start playing um, drums until I was like 26. Okay. Where, and I was in Columbus then. Um, and before that I was like, would participate I guess by doing like gig posters, a lot of gig posters and like record covers for like different people, like seven inches and stuff like that. The first time I did a um, record cover was when I was 15 for my brother's band. Um, so I had like sporadic participation, like, um, but, you know, being kind of an overprotected kid, being kind of, I don't know if it was shy, but just reticent or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of like the atmosphere of like, you know, that time, which was uh, being like a girl or whatever. Like there just, there wasn't a lot of stuff the way that there is now where people are like, you know, yeah, you're a girl, get in a band, or, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was, like, not good to be a girl. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and like, you know, the, the internalized uh, misogyny of, of women competing instead of, like, welcoming. Right. Very much existed. Right. Uh, people didn't know what my name was. I was, like, called by, like, you know, uh, by, like, oh, you're this person's girlfriend. Gotcha. More than like how mm. every person wants to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or people wouldn't recognize me if I was not standing next to my boyfriend mm. or something like that. So when I was 26, I started playing drums and I got into a band like super quickly. And so I guess like that's kind of when I started probably being considered being more part of a scene visibly. So I was always at the corners. <laughs> Why didn't your parents let you have an electric guitar? I'm really <laughs> like fascinated. Was it just like a cost thing or? No, because I raised the money myself. Like I had a okay. job when I was like, I don't know. I think I had, I had my first job when I was like nine. Oh, but, I had mine when I was 14. Really? So I was like, <laughs> yeah, I made antiques. <laughs> I, I answered phones for the church. I might have that, right? I might be like 10 or 11. Okay. And But I, I answered phones, I worked, the bingo hall they would like and people would like tip you like a nickel and you would like come home with like nine dollars so and or i worked and i answered phones for the church so okay. like i would and they would give you like eleven dollars for like four hours and 
like people will just call you and be like, when's church? And then like you would stuff the bulletins and stuff like that. Um, so I raised the money myself. I don't know. It, it was, as far as I know, it was strictly like you have to get straight A's. Oh. And I don't see my parents, uh, especially my father was very, well, m I would say probably just my father was mostly like, we don't, you can't sustain yourself doing these things. You are only going to, we're only going to let you sustain yourself uh, or we're only going to let you concentrate on things that you can sustain yourself with. So I don't know why I wasn't allowed to buy an electric guitar, but I did have pastels. <laughs> but, you know, I don't know. So You're like, I, don't I know. can only choose one of these right. things. <laughs> let me tell you, I do not understand my parents. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny because when I was um, little, I decided that I was going to be a writer because that costs less than buying art supplies. <laughs> I was like, this is the cheaper option. <laughs> um, so my parents will let me. <laughs> um, so when did you begin documenting the presence of black artists in the scene? Um, I started out with like Proctober. So there was oh, okay. that, um, there's the, the I, I, I guess I would famous um, drawing challenge in October called Inktober. Yeah. And there's one called Drawloween. And I don't know how I heard about them, but I did one of them in 2017, but I had a hard time like with the prompts because I don't remember. I don't know if I thought it was like, some of them are kind of, I don't, it was like something about them that was kind of uh, hard to pin down whenever one I did it, mm -hmm. and or, or, you know, like draw a witch or not. Yeah, or the something. prompts seem kind of vague. Yeah, like, and I, I guess I was like not as interested. Um, I hadn't done anything but gig posters in like 10 years because my entire life was being in bands mm -hmm. or working and then being in bands. And so I kind of lost the ability to draw well, I oh. thought, or draw a lot well. And so it started off me just wanting to draw like, uh, figure so I could start, you know, doing like comics again, like ash cans and stuff like that, like the way I used to do yeah. before I was in, um, you know, bands. But um, I think I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? I was asking you, like, how you started documenting black artists. Oh, in the yeah. Scene. So it was with Pocktober. So I decided the 2018, I decided that I was going to um, think of what I would want to draw. So then I decided on uh, black punk rockers as a way for me to be able to research and learn more myself yeah. because nobody was telling me or whatever. It's funny because even now I'll find out somebody before the internet, before like, you know, when you live in a different like region as some people or whatever, and you're listening to stuff on like, like DH Polygro from Dead Kennedys was on my first mixtape. But you know, my first mixtape didn't say like, hey, the drummer from the Dead Kennedys is black, you know? It, so, that wasn't the title? Yeah. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so there are some, people that I like just didn't know. And then I'm like, oh, Fang had a black member. And you know, so like just researching it, like giving myself time in a project and like time to, to be able to sit with stuff, like to be able to listen to new music that I found while I'm drawing mm -hmm. and then time to like research it and like, you know, kind of like just build my record collection up that way too, yeah. you know, instead of just being like, Oh, I can name some bands. You know what I mean? Like seeing who their influences were and who they influenced and right. stuff like that. So yeah, in 2018 with the drawing challenge, that's pretty much when I started. You said 2018 was when Pocktober started? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. Um, something that I love about your book is that it's called The Secret History of Black Punk, but you're also incorporating other figures into that history mm -hmm. that we might not consider punk. So like someone like Rosetta Tharp, for mm -hmm. example, um, which this is a page from that section about Rosetta Tharp. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that choice to incorporate a wider range of musicians or like trace a bigger history within that, um, within that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that 
Sister Rosetta Tharp is somebody's name, like people do recognize her name more now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly how other people, like every, how everyone gets their information or how like widely things are dispersed at the same time, but like similar to a lot of people not knowing who the band Death was and then a lot of people knowing who the band Death was. I know that was because of the movie, but it seemed like the second like I knew who Death was, there were several people around me who knew who Death was. And like with Rosetta Tharp, that's kind of how I felt too. I did not know who Sister Rosetta Tharp was at one point, and as soon as I knew who she was, I felt like there were several people around me, and I don't know why. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that she was talked about it was not a known factor in my life that Sister Rosetta Tharp had, um, you know, a really big hand in, she was the transition of what would begin to be known as rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I don't know how much people know about her. And so I wanted to put her in the book because Although I think when people get into something like punk rock or whatever, you know, the, like a youth culture that they start to form their identity over, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's very, the distinction between that genre and other genres is very important. But I think the more if you stay in like, you know, uh, in that genre that you kind of probably found when you were younger, um, you start to be interested in why. Who were they listening to? Why did they sound like that? And where, what, what are the distinction between genres? Like, and so that I wanted to include Sister Rosetta Tharp because I wanted to be able to tie her to like the lineage of punk rock through rock and roll. Mm -hmm which punk rock is rock and roll, even right. though it's very common to say that it's different. It's not yeah. very different. There's differences, but like, again, like the distinction between genres can be very fluid. And I think it's like so important what you're saying about like um, tracking influence between different generations or different like movements. Mm -hmm. um, because like, I think whenever you're doing history about a group of people that's been marginalized, it's really, like the influence gets lost. Like, it's harder to track those connections. Yeah, and I think that like, there, like for example, there are like punk bands that, you know, are like lightly to heavily in, influenced by Elvis, by right. some aspect of Elvis. Um, and Rosetta Tharp was, one of Elvis's favorite artists. Yeah. Um, and not only that, Elvis was somebody who would go to the church and, and learn from you know, the music of the church, from the Pentecostal church. And so, but, but you know, people can recognize Elvis in some of these like punk bands, but like it is lost that Elvis had an influence by you know, somebody else. Right. Yeah. Did I think Sister Rosetta Tharp, she just recently passed away, right? Is that correct or is, no? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm confused. Um, I also love this portrait that you did of her with her electric guitar. <laughs> um, it makes me wonder if, like are you listening to the music from the folks as you're creating these images? She had, um, I'm not gonna remember what the TV show was or the time was, but you can see a YouTube video. It's in England. Oh, okay. Where she's playing and she like gets off the train, and the train is like driving by. That's incredible. And it's like raining. Yeah. Lightly, but she's like, and then, um, she's you know not young at that point. Um, I can't remember the TV show, 
but yeah, there's a YouTube video that you can find. That's why I put her on the, the train the track. Train she wasn't isolated. It was being filmed and um, right. there were people there and right. stuff like that. So. She was just being a rock star. <laughs> it's really cool to see the way that people move back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, she did a version of like what we know as like the duck walk, um, which is like something that Chuck Berry did and something that like Angus Young from ACDC did. Mm -hmm. But um, she was the beginning of that. Whether oh, wow. people, whether Angus Young know, you know. Right, whether it's acknowledged or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. Chuck <laughs> Berry acknowledges it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool to see, um, you know, a an older black woman playing guitar like that. Right. Like the image, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's, it's just not, you do see it, it's not always spotlighted, or spotlit, sorry. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, but it just makes you like, really, the imagery just opens something up, like makes you super proud to be able to know and see. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the other thing I love about your book is that it kind of balances these like portraits of um, with like your writing and then also integrates comics. So it's not just comics, there's like portraiture, there's like, it feels like a zine to me. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk about like putting the book together and like those choices that you were making in terms of like, do I represent the Nova Twins through a portrait or do I make a comic about them? Like mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Or like any of the artists that you worked on? Yeah, a lot of, so a lot of the um, drawings are directly from Pocktober. Oh, cool. So they were like already done and it like, so it was kind of a collation, if that's a word, of, of that stuff. And then um, the stuff that was put in later has a little bit more of like panels yeah. and stuff like that. But I would say that like, you know, my influence, some of my influences like art wise are just punk posters, like okay. just, you know, those, I wouldn't say anonymous, but you don't necessarily know who everybody is that's by okay. they're That's just okay. <laughs> yeah collage xerox like yeah um, like kind of the zine aesthetic or diy stuff mm -hmm. yeah yeah so i know there's a um i was a graphic designer for 12 years so it's probably like just you know regular <laughs> graphic design work. I was gonna say, I'm like, Reagan's book is like one of the most well laid out books. <laughs> um, very meticulous about the design, so. Mm -hmm. That's the, um, that's actually, the wave is from like the cover, that's kind of how their, their covers look. Oh, cool. So yeah, I guess I would, you know, look at the different things. I, that was something that I, I, redrew them because there's not a lot of pictures of ESG until you start digging. Yeah. And you don't you can't always like have access to the photographers. And so I would try to reach out and ask permission. I remember and, you doing that. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah. It was just a lot of work. And then like sometimes you have to talk to them in ways that like might not seem like super professional or whatever. Like if I'm if I can find your email, then I'll email you. But if I can't find your email, you then I like Instagram message you or whatever. Right. And if I could see somebody saw it and they didn't respond, then I I didn't know how to take that. So I asked somebody about the, an ESG drawing and they didn't respond. Okay. I could see that they saw it, but it led me to like look on YouTube. Um, which again, once when you're aware of like bands or like things and you were, lives like the bulk of your life before like the internet was like a huge factor, then when you don't always like go back and be like, oh, I wonder what this person looked like. Or, you know what I mean? It just doesn't occur to you to do it to everything. Right. But there is also video of ESG from 1978 that somebody uploaded upload to, uh, to YouTube. So, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff with like just the video stills and stuff like that. And um, so, yeah, that's 
I forgot the question. No, that makes sense. Um, and it seems like important, especially with this project, to kind of like be bringing visibility or like putting an image to these bands that we might not see like, like you see images of like Blondie all over Instagram or like, you know, just like, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh, it's so iconic, but not, not these voices as much. Yeah. yeah, and like with a band like ESG, you, I mean, not being there, but like seeing like the videos, uh, you can get, I don't know, like with ESG, like you can get the weird spacing. You can understand why somebody would call them like a no wave band mm -hmm. more than, you know, like a funk band uh, because of like, the, you know, a little bit of the strange awkwardness on stage. Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, it was like really interesting for me to see too. Yeah. And also ESG is a band that um, normally they, for some reason only have like, showcase like three of them. So for a long time I thought there was only three people in the band. They're all sisters um, and uh, their friend Tita. That. Tito, huh? I didn't realize they were all sisters. Yeah, and and one thing that I did have a hard time with in the in like w dating, like incidentally, is because there are like several sibling bands, and I don't know when you say that your sibling band started. They started playing in '72. I don't know what they sounded like if they like made a song. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I imagine they were playing together a lot. Earlier. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know when they named themselves ESG. I know their first show was 78. They have, like, some of these bands have, like, a documentary brewing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you never know if it's ever going to come out. Right. <laughs> but they're one of the bands that, like, advertise for, like, documentaries. I don't know when it's going to, you know. So hopefully, you know, we can know more about some people soon. Yeah. But... And if you read the book, obviously, you'll oh, learn yeah. a lot. <laughs> um, not to skip over Killer of Sheep, but I do want to talk about this comic that you made of Carla Mad Dog, uh, which is one of like the, f uh, not to say few comics in the book, but it definitely stands out. Um, could you talk a little bit about this, like creating this story? Yes. So I, Carla Mad Dog passed last year. And before she passed, um, there were rumors of her passing. Mm -hmm. So maybe like six years ago, people, she was not a visible person to everybody. Um, she played in other bands after the controllers and she played in, I think she was playing in some form, doing some form of music until she started getting sick. Okay. But, I um, didn't know where she was and I didn't have access to be able to talk to her. Yeah. And I didn't really know where to start when I was like doing this part of the comic. And the fact is the more I do stuff like this, the more access that I have to people because the more people are willing to talk to me who don't know who I am. Okay. And then the more people know that I'm interested in this that like wouldn't have known that before. Like when, so uh, this person, Bim from Obnox, that's also in the book. Mm -hmm. I talked to him on the phone like maybe like three months ago and I realized he told me that he'd played with her. Oh wow. But it's just not something that came up in conversation right. before. But then he, you know, he's like, oh yeah, I played with Carla Mad Dog. She was in a band with Falling James and we used to do this and that and this. So I don't have access to her, um, talk to her. But she like made like a I don't I don't know what it was, but you know those personal websites that were super popular. Yeah, like, like an Angel Fire website? Yeah, I don't know what it was, cities. but she made a, and I don't know if it's still up because she passed, and I don't know if that's one of those things that they'll take down after a while or if yeah. they stay up, if they're the old thing. I think you can access them through like the Wayback Machine maybe, even if they take it down. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. The internet is hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate like when I, because I didn't, I'm just so like behind where I should be on things like that. I'm like, yeah, like, you know, 
you know this thing called YouTube you could check out or whatever. <laughs> but it's hey like, kids, have you heard about YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so she like kind of wrote out uh, her story on her website. Oh, cool. And so, uh, you know, there's a references page in the back for the comic book or whatever. But like, um, but I got a lot of that from her website. There's also um, footage, like uh, I got a quote from, that's from the Afropunk documentary by James Spooner. Oh, okay. Who like, I, the comics world is like knowing because of Yeah, him. his graphic. Yeah, memoir. the high, um, high Desert. Yeah. Um, but he has like been active in like punk scenes since he was like 16 years old. He was in bands, he was, um, he had a record label and he did like, you know, the Afropunk documentary that is, you know, now Afropunk, which is, you know, a totally different version of what Afropunk was like when he was involved. Yeah. But the Afropunk documentary, he's got like, you know, archives of, I think they're in like the, the University of Indiana. Oh, okay. They're, I know he donated his archives to the university. I didn't ask him, but okay. I know that there are Afropunk. Uh, there, he, there's a, you know, if you go on the website, like, unless I'm wrong about the actual play, <laughs> James is going to come in and be I like, you're all wrong. <laughs> Stop talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, you, uh, there are interviews with her that like, were included okay. in the documentary. And I know that there are ones that are not, but I know there's stuff out there. But again, I only have like a little bit of access to everything. So a lot of that was like from her um, her website. And I had to leave like a lot of stuff out, you mm -hmm. know, um, as with all the book, like I didn't have like enough space to go like deeply into everything. So there could be a second I, secret history of black punk too. Oh, like, <laughs> There's also interviews like in um, the old magazines and stuff like that with yeah. her and everything like that. And she's like, I mean, everybody has like an interesting story, but like she's definitely vocal about, you know, the different things that like she's been through and yeah. that have happened to her. One thing that is interesting about her in interviews is that, in my opinion, some of the interviews, interviewers, didn't treat her very well. Right. And, um, you know, it's punk rock. It's uh, people are rude to each other. People are, you know, I don't, they call it edgy now, mm -hmm. but like shitty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, so people would ask her uh, questions that are like, you know, in my opinion, racist. Like, okay. oh, you don't have a Cadillac, et cetera, like stuff like that or whatever. Wow. But in spite of those questions, I felt like, she did a good job of like giving information, you yeah. know what I mean? That like, even if the interviewer wasn't taking her seriously, when I'm looking at the interview, I'm taking her seriously. So I'm very glad that she answered like questions in an informational way, yeah. even though her interviewer may not have been taking her very seriously. And again, part of it is that is how people talk to each other, but right. there is a racist part of it as well. Right. Um, yeah, that's kind of like interesting. It's almost like she could like see past the interview to like, oh, this information is really important. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to be watching in the future. She was the reason that the controllers got um, a lot of buzz um, to the band that she was in. She, her interviewing and her talking about it was a reason that people started um, paying attention to the controllers. And the controllers did not become a band that like, you know, people that got big mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, yeah. And they're not even necessarily a band that people mention when they talk about like um, punk unless they're specifically talking about LA punk okay, or whatever. But people know who they are. It's just, you know, they're not, like, people don't know who they are the way they know who the clash is. Right. <laughs> but that, was, that wasn't in a big part because of her and that's been documented and people admit that, so. Um, this kind of leads into my next question, which is, you seem like a really meticulous researcher, but so much of the history that you're engaging with about black musicians, uh, it seems like it's kind of out there piecemeal, like it's not, 
there's not a book, there's not an archive. Um, you have to kind of make connections as you go. So I'm just interested in hearing from you what the research proce process for this book is like or for your other projects. It was, it's really, it can be really tough. Yeah. And, and it can be like, uh, I'm not an academic. I wasn't taught to do this. Um, like I had to like struggle to get to the point where I was making sense, you know? So I had to like struggle with my own limitations and like trying to figure out where you get correct information mm -hmm. and what is the truth and what is less than the truth. Like in music, whatever, but people exaggerate. So um, stuff like that. Uh, and it was hard, like for a band, for example, Pure Hell, who uh, they're talked about as the um, first black punk band. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of places where I found out that they were, that they were not listed on the poster or on the show. Wow. There were residencies for music back then, and there were some you know, times where like you would see the poster, you would see the date, you would see the other bands that were on it, and you would see that the name Pure Hell wasn't there. Or they went on tour in England and there was listings in the music magazines that said like who the tour dates were like collated and stuff like that. And like for example, there was like a UK subs tour. And I know that they were on there, but they were not in that like magazine. Right, they're there but they're not included. Right. And yeah. so other people who while you're playing music, you know, other people are more documenting what you're doing than you are specifically sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, or you know, concentrating you're concentrating on playing music or doing whatever. And you know, somebody's taking a picture of you at the show, but if they're not taking a picture of you, Carla Mad Dog is in uh, The Decline of the Western Civilization by Penelope Spirits in the audience. Oh, really? She's not, they're not, the controllers are not video. Uh, they are not like, I don't know if they played that day, but they are not filmed on the stage that day. Um, and I'm sure that there's lots of footage that didn't make it into the movie. Mm -hmm. But when I'm watching the movie and I see her walk across the screen, yeah. I'm like, Carla Mad Dog was there. Yeah. Like, okay, what else happened? Yeah. But that's all it is. You know what I mean? If, you get like and I'm not blaming, glimpses. I'm not like, you know, saying like, this movie. I'm saying yeah. across the board, that's how it was. So it's very tough. And some of the information that I got was by like, wrongly posting something like mm -hmm. pure hell blah 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 and then somebody like oh yo from killer a sheep or bim from abnox like tagging like some their facebook account and them coming in and being like this is not true okay and then me being like well can you i'm very interested can you tell me yeah and they like most people are like yeah sure this is what you have wrong and this is what's right or whatever or some people do have like archives of their own stuff, it might not be with them, they might not have time to go f through it or whatever, yeah. but like, I'm, you know, I'm learning how to do research. This is my first time uh, in Maryland, and so yesterday I went to the DC, uh, I went to, C to the um, MLK library. Yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Yeah, so I went through the DC punk archives, not went through them all, but they pulled out some of them for me or whatever. And I think that's the first time I like went to, you know, a place that had like, those kind of things that I could like pull out and go through and do research like that. Yeah. And I'm hoping that in the future, I'll be able to do more of that stuff. But it's just like, the whole like, you know, punk DIY stuff, you just do it. Yeah. And then like, you might not have it all the way right, but like, I'm not talking about the information, I mean like the processes and blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm not saying, anyways. Um, but like, you know, in the future, I would probably start with more of that. In the future, I would probably make a, like a stronger effort to interview people directly, but I didn't have like the connections 
Right. To just. It's like you have to put the book out to. Um, yeah. To be like, hey, I'm making this. Yeah. Well, and people are busy. Not everybody. If, if, if a band was not recognized back then, then, you know, s some of these bands started touring again, and people were really excited to see them. And people, they, you know, people would have um, guarantees that were, you know, a little bit higher if you want some bands to like come in play your city like a his, like historically punk band or whatever yeah but if people never gave you your props or whatever um then you didn't make any money you like you know you might not have made any money from music which means right. you're just doing the same thing as everybody else which is like trying to work to put food on your table right. and stuff like that so you're not like people are not always like out there like going around or whatever yeah <laughs> no one of the things I really admire about what you said is like because I am an academic I actually don't know how to research either <laughs> um, and no one teaches you which sucks <laughs> and you just end up okay maybe I have the wrong idea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one teaches you. You're just out there. <laughs> Maybe other people's experience is different, but I don't know. That was mine. Um, but like that willingness to accept correction um, or to be like, oh, yeah, like I don't know any everything. I'm learning about this, I think is like really admirable. I feel like there's too much. Too often we just like pretend we know what we're doing. <laughs> and it's like... I feel better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to research either. <laughs> I have a doctorate. <laughs> this is going on the internet. <laughs> um, oh yeah, here's you performing. Because you do perform in bands um, yeah. in addition to making comics as you are multi-talented. Um, I do want to open it up to questions in a moment, so start thinking of questions, audience. And there are mics at the back. I've been told to direct you there to ask questions. Um, but I did want to showcase, here's your zine, Strange Glances. This is the Pocktober sketchbook. Um, and y'all should follow Pocktober art. They're starting up again this year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to just showcase a couple other things that you do. Oh no, I forgot I had these in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to show your mural, actually. You recently completed this mural in Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen it in person yet, but obviously working on a mural is way different than making a comic or being in a band. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about this piece a little bit. Oh, that was for the, um, the hilltop uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and they kind of, I don't, I guess like I would like lightly explain it as maybe the Hilltop um, Arts Organization trying to like, I, I would, I don't know if I'm going to use the word right, but like beautify the area. Uh -huh. um, the area has like a lot of issues sometimes. Is this, on, is this on the east side? It's in the Hilltop. Oh, okay. Hilltop, yeah. Um, and so, and, and just like not, I don't think it was like the, you know, prime area where people were uh, commissioning for murals. Yeah. Um, so every year the uh, organization chooses an artist to do a mural on the side of the buildings. And I, this might be like the sixth mural. It's okay. not a huge area of town, but like, and people, are happy about um, you know people throwing some color on the walls and stuff like that. That's Ava's uh, Caribbean. It was like amazing. The food, Ava's food, like we got fed every day. It was great. But yeah, it's different. Um, it's just a different process. You gotta. It's large. You gotta paint. And, uh, Here's you painting. Yeah. <laughs> Up on a ladder. <laughs> no, I was like, after I did that, like, because I was working on that, um, the the person that I did Pogtober with, like, he, uh, Southside Frank was helping me. Um, he was like my helper on it. Yeah. And I was up on the ladder and I was like, he was like, yo, be careful. Like, what are you doing? And then afterwards, I was like, man, I was not respecting that ladder. Because then I was like, <laughs> 
<laughs> learn something about ladders and like that they're like dangerous and stuff like that. And I was right. like, <laughs> <You're> I'm, <just laughs> I feel like I'm gonna do more ladder safety <laughs> for next time. This is only your like second or third. This is like my third. Your, your third mural? Yeah. Yeah. But I was really excited about that ladder because my dad was like, you can, there's ladders that, you know, you can open up. <laughs> they go really hard. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, word. <laughs> I'm glad that you used the ladder correctly and learned about the ladder. I would fall. Um, I always see Brian do these lat like big murals, and I'm like, no, I'm staying on the ground. Well, someday, I'm, I hope that someday they'll give me a lift. <laughs> like, how high does the mural have to go before they give, give you, you a, a platform? <laughs> Yeah, let's get Reagan some money for a lift and to go do research. Um, okay, I got the 10-minute warning, so I ha we have time for like maybe two questions. Would anyone like to go to the microphone and ask Reagan a question? <laughs> You're welcome to. The microphones are on either side. Yay, someone, yes. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, do you have a favorite gig that you played at? That, that I played at? Um, when I was, um, I'm, I'm somebody, I actually have a terrible memory. Um, one of my favorite things that I've ever done was, so when I learned to play drums, I played drums for about three months before I was in a band. And then I think three months after that, I went on my first tour, which was in Europe. So like my first experience, like, my jaw just dropped. Yeah. <laughs> With, but it's because of like the networking. You know what I mean? Like it's not like somebody booking you because you're important. It's like everybody like, oh, you know, we have a couch. We have these connections. We've played here before, so let's go or whatever. So we played in this. Um, that we were in France and uh, we played in this like underground cave or whatever. Um, and people, like I always say like in America, like when bands come here, they're like, here's a pizza and a floor. In France, it's like, here's a cave. <laughs> no, but they, no they, they, when we were over in Europe, they cooked food and brought it to us. We they would do like- know how to cook there. They, we would eat like um, before the gig. Like they would bring us like food and we would sit down with all the bands and like eat and stuff like that. That's and awesome. they were like, and people would put us up and like people had like extra houses that bands could stay in. I think like they, the government paid, or back then the government paid um, bands. If oh. you like do a certain amount of gigs per like month, then you would like be considered like a work, that's what they told us anyways. You would be considered like a, a musician and you could get a stipend from the government or wow. whatever. So I don't know how all of it plays into it, but I know it wasn't pizza in a floor. <laughs> in France, you can get a cave, a chateau, <laughs> and a home cooked meal. Um, hi, Francesca. Hello. <laughs> hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering, since you've not only like um, made a whole like book about being black and in punk bands, but you've also been in bands yourself, and you're also a cartoonist. If you find any similarities to what it's like to be maybe like a black woman making cartoon, doing cartooning, and being a black woman um, within kind of punk, the punk scene. Was, was that two questions was the first I one? I feel like that was supposed to be one question, but I messed it up and it was supposed to be, like it was supposed to be one, but it came up as two. I was more wondering like, do you find similarities to being a black woman in, in cartooning and then also a, like just the black experience within punk, the punk scene? I can say that, I can say that when you say things, you not talk, I don't know how to say this. Um, I, I'm not treated the same by everybody across the board. I'm not, um, but I can say that in every situation that I've been in, it has been common for people to believe for one reason or the other that I don't know what I'm doing um, or that I don't know what I'm talking about or that I, I shouldn't be there or, you know, uh, in bands it would like manifest as like uh, not being able to go where the rest of the band was because they assumed I was like 
not in the band, or something like that, or, or again, people not knowing my name, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And my, like, from the beginning of when I started doing stuff to now, like, the world has changed a little bit, and so people have treated me, for the most part, very well since they've learned that I've done cartoons, but I stopped doing, uh, like, the, car the zines and comics and stuff that I did in, like, I want to say like 2006 or something like that, because nobody cared what I was doing. They, nobody like was interested uh, in picking this stuff up. Not nobody. Right. But no, like, I know what you mean. Yeah. And so I, I would say that there's like similarities there. Sorry that that's. I know that there's also positive ones. Sorry I gave you the the negative. <laughs> no, that was great. That was wonderful. Also like relatable. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I remember you came over, because I was like, I'm done with comics. I don't want to do any more comics writing or anything. And you were like, you know what? I quit once, too, and maybe you should rethink that. <laughs> I wish that, like, I feel like I, oh, I wish I had, like, that story where I was like, she persevered. But it's, like, really <laughs> overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. And I, you can't, like, I don't know for myself, like, you can't do everything. Because at the same time, you also, like, have to have a job that you hate and, like, you know, f fight with your family and like have like have a boyfriend yeah to fight with breakups too. and makeups Break yeah. and <laughs> you have to live life <laughs> yeah yeah so it's like hard to like take on like everything but like and that's like not the first time that I've like stopped doing stuff and even this book is like the result of like friends being like can you it's okay you can you should do this like keep doing this like you know what I mean yeah like the community kind yeah. of saying like no keep going yeah like friends like you know like mossy and like people yeah. like that like so um yeah so i yeah i, I would can I, I wish that i didn't tell people also like i didn't necessarily tell people that i was stopping i just stopped and then i was like nobody even noticed that i stopped so whatever you know what i mean well i would notice if you stop now um so <laughs> please don't um and i'm glad you're making books <laughs> um where can people find you today Right. Uh, the Silver Sprocket, J2, J1 yeah. or J2. Silver Sprocket table, are you signing? Yeah, after this I'm supposed to go over and sign for an hour. Yeah, everyone go get a book from Reagan right after this and get it signed. Promise, pinky promise. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much, this was super fun. <laughs> and thank you, Reagan. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs>